welcome to the Old Time Radio Westerns. I'm your host, Andrew Rines, and let's get into this episode. This episode is going to be Challenge of the Yukon. Original air date is March 22nd, 1950, and the title is The Fugitive Bride. Hope you enjoy, and let's get into it. Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. And King, and Huskies. Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Golly, do you know what that reminds me of? Why, it makes me just downright hungry for lots of milk and fruit on a heaping bowl of Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice. That's what. Mmm, mmm, there's a treat. You take a big spoonful, and those king-size grains of wheat or rice taste crisp and tempting, full of nut-like flavor. Tomorrow morning, enjoy this treat. Delicious, nourishing... Quaker Puff Rice or Quaker Puff Wheat. I'll teach you to snarl at me, you ornery mutt. (laughs) Flackjack Gannon brought the length of chain down across his lead dog's head. A beautiful white Siberian. Carol Lee had just opened the back door of the Empire Cafe and saw him. What's the matter with you? There must be some law against beating a dog like that. If you don't stop it, I'm going to report you to the Northwest Mounted. Yeah? Are you anxious to lose your job? I don't care. Think about it. Don't try to tell me how to treat my dog. What good does beating him do? You're making him hate you. You're making him hate everybody. I guess you could train him better. Well, I couldn't do worse. Mind your own business. Get back inside there and sing your songs. Hurry up. All right, go ahead. Cut him to ribbons. You're making an enemy, Jack. It'll be your own fault if Whitey kills you someday. I'm sorry, Whitey. I'm sorry you have such a brute for a mess. You heard me. Get back inside. Take your hands off me. I'm going. The girl re-entered the cafe. (laughs) She pushed her way through the crowd toward the stage until she felt a hand on her arm. It was young Bill Morgan who stopped her. Carol. Please, Bill, it's time for me to sing. You promised you'd give me your answer tonight. I... I can't. Well, I... I sort of guess that's what it would be. It's pretty lonely living at a trading post a hundred miles from the bright lights. That isn't my reason. I, I just can't marry you. Not now. Perhaps someday things will be different. But, Carol, don't Please, you... Please, I've got to sing. I'll see you later. Uh, here she is, gents. The treat you've been waiting for. That lovely, lovely little lady, the songbird of the Yukon, Carolee. After her songs, Carol went to her dressing room and back of the stage and changed into street clothes. She was just slipping into her parka when someone knocked on the door. Who's there? A friend. Who are you? I'm a friend of your brother's, too. Can I come in? Yes. Who are you? I don't know you. The name's Brandon. Most folks call me Scar. I just got in from Frisco. You said you knew my brother. Yeah, that's right. Does Blackjack know you're Mike Donovan's sister? No. Well, that interests me. A lot of us in Frisco figure that Blackjack killed Mike. He did. Here I find you singing songs in Blackjack's cafe. 
I wonder why. That's my business. Blackjack might count it a favor if I was to tell him a truth about you. Would he? Of course, I'm not any special friend of his. I say whatever he gets, he deserves. How are you planning to get even, Carol? I didn't say I was. I wonder what Blackjack would do if he was to find out. He'd probably find some way to get rid of me. Yeah, yeah, he, he's got lots of ways, too. What do you want? Want? If it's money, I haven't any. I can't pay you to keep money? quiet. Money? No, I came up here to Dawson to collect a debt. I'll have plenty of money before the night's over. Then I'll be ready to start in business for myself. When I do, I can use a partner. You'd suit me fine. No, thank you. Better think it over. Or shall I drop a word to Blackjack? No, don't do that. You'll think it over? <laughs> yes. Go on, get out of here. Sure. Sure, partner. Carol sank into a chair after Scar had left. She stared unseeing into the mirror for several minutes. Then she roused herself. <laughs> She walked out into the cafe and searched through the crowd until she found Bill Morgan. Bill. Hello, Carol. I've never heard you sing that. Bill, I've changed my mind. I'll marry you. What? On one condition. Oh, just name it. That you take me away from here tonight. We can stop at the mission on the way to the post. Wonderful, honey. You know where my cabin is. Meet me there in half an hour. Carol, you, you won't be sorry. I know I won't. Half an hour, Bill. I'll get my team harnessed. I'll be there in 15 minutes. No. Half an hour. Yeah, whatever you say. Carol watched Bill hurry out the front door of the cafe. Then she turned and walked out the back door. She walked straight to the run where Black Jack kept his dogs and opened the gate. Whitey, the big Siberian, was chained in one corner. <laughs> Easy, Whitey. I know you don't trust anybody, but I'm not going to hurt you. I'm just going to set you free. <laughs> There. Go on, boy. He won't beat you anymore. The dog looked up into the girl's face for a second as the chain dropped to the ground. And then he bounded through the open gate of the rod. Good luck, Whitey. It's a poor revenge, but it's the best I can do. The girl looked up at the lighted window of Black Jack's office on the second floor. She could see two figures silhouetted, two men. She saw one of them raise his arm, a knife in his hand. The hand plunged downward. The second man dropped from sight. The girl ran, terror-stricken, around the corner of the building, into Front Street, and then down it toward the Klondike. When she reached her cabin, she was gasping for breath. But she only paused for a second and then started packing her clothes. A short time later, she was ready and waiting when Bill stopped his team outside. Nothing, as long as you get me away from here, fast. Oh, here, honey, I'll stow your things. There, climb aboard. Yeah, uh, all set? Yes. Mush! Mush on! Carol and Bill were married that night at the mission and drove on to Bill's trading post far to the north of Beaver City. It was a week later that they saw Whitey, he was standing at the edge of the forest, looking toward the post. Carol, I'd swear that was Black Jack's lead dog. Where? Huh, see? Yes, it is. He must have followed us. Well, how come? I set him free that night we left Dawson. I couldn't leave him there to be mistreated. Carol, I... I haven't asked any questions about that night, but... I, I can't help wondering why you changed your mind so suddenly. Don't ask any questions now. Can't we forget about Dawson? Well, uh... That's the way you want it. Yes, please. All right. Poor Whitey. Do you think he's looking for a new home? No. I don't think he'll ever trust a human being again. Not after the way Blackjack beat him. Well, let's see. Come on, call him. He won't come any closer. Try it. Well, all right. Here, Whitey. The dog stood his ground for a moment. He seemed to want to come closer to the post. But suddenly he turned and ran into the forest. I told you, Bill. I'm going after It's no use. He looks hungry to me. Let's see if he can resist this caribou steak. I'm going to try and make friends with him. You'll never catch up with him. Uh, we'll see, honey. Here, Whitey. Come here, boy. Bill hurried across the clearing and disappeared in the forest. Carol continued with her work for nearly an hour, 
Then she heard a dog team out in front of the post. When she opened the door from the living quarters into the store, there was a man warming his hands over the stove. She recognized him. Joe Ferguson, one of Black Jack's henchmen. Hello, Carol. Hello. Surprised? A little. You should be. What do you want? Nothing much. This is just a friendly visit. Where's your husband? He isn't here. That's good. Now we can have a nice little talk. What about? About Scar Brandon, Carol. Look, Joe, I don't have anything to say to you, and I don't have anything to say to Blackjack. If he sent you he here... He did more than that. He came with me. What? Yeah. He's waiting for you. There's an old trapper's cabin in the woods a couple of miles to the south. Know it? No. It's easy to find. I don't want to have anything more to do with you, any of you. Carol, it's for your own good that you should have a talk with Blackjack. He may need his help before long. He may need it bad. Why? Because the Northwest Mounted Police are looking for you. No. Yeah. You see, the morning after you left Dawson, Scar Brandon was found in a gully near your cabin. Somebody had stuck a knife in his back. What does that have to do with me? The police think you did it. Well, they're wrong, Joe. But I know who did do it. You better have a talk with Blackjack. You wouldn't want anything to happen to Bill, would you? And this is for your own good, Carol. You're in a bad spot. The last time Scar was seen alive, he was asking the way to your dressing room. You're going to be accused of murder. We'll continue our adventure in just a moment. Say, fellas and girls, yesterday was officially the first day of spring. Golly, there's nothing like springtime. Good heavens, look what flew in. A, a robin. Gee, he isn't a bit afraid. Looks smart enough to talk, too. Hello there, Jay. What in the world is he... Hmm? Did that robin say something? I said, hello there. You're a talking robin? What's wrong with that? You talk, don't you? And plenty. Well, of course. There's plenty to tell about delicious Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. They're ready to serve breakfast cereals shot from guns. These giant king-sized grains are shot from guns to make them crisp and tender. Yes, Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice are actually exploded up to eight times normal size to make them bigger and better tasting. And what's more, wheat or rice shot from guns furnishes added food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. Good and good for you. That's Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat. The famous cereals that come only in the big red and blue packages. Did you say something about red? Oh, being a Robin Redbreast, you would perk up at that. Yes, just like we can always tell you by your color, the fellas and girls can always tell Quaker Popped Wheat and Quaker Popped Rice by the red and blue packages with the smiling Quaker man on the front. They're never sold in bags or bulk. So, fellas and girls, get the original, crisp, fresh... Quaker puff wheat and Quaker puff rice. Shot from gun. Now to continue. That same afternoon, Sergeant Preston stopped his team in front of Bill Morgan's trading post. Just as the light was beginning to fail. Hulking, hull, hulking, hull. Bill and Carol came out to meet him, and he waved a hello. But King was more interested in the white dog standing at the edge of the clearing. <laughs> hello, Sergeant. Welcome. We're honored, Sergeant. Hello, Carol. Hello, Bill. That one of your dogs over there? No, it's Black Jack Gannon's lead. I thought it was. <laughs> I spent most of the afternoon trying to make friends with him, and not a chance. But I still think that Carol might if she tried. Uh, hey, you haven't come up here to arrest her, have you? Arrest her? What for? Well, you better make a full confession, Carol. What? Oh. oh, I don't mind at all. I set Whitey free tonight, Bill and I eloped, Sergeant. He seems to have followed us, but you can't very well say that we tried to steal him. No. Look at him. Good dog and a dog that would like a good home. He's afraid. If he sticks around here, he may get over it in time, don't you think, Sergeant? It's possible, Bill. 
But say, I haven't congratulated you two yet. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Sag. How did you find out? From Father Michelle. Oh, you're going to stay the night, aren't you? It looks to me as if we're going to have a blizzard. I believe you're right. Yes, I'd like to stay. Good, good. Uh, I'll drive the team around him back. Uh, honey, take him inside and give him a cup of tea to hold him until supper. Huh? That's a good idea. <laughs> Come along, Sergeant. Come on, King. <laughs> Get around there, boy. Come on. Come on. Carol, before Bill comes in, did you talk to Scar Brandon on the night you left Dawson? What? Brandon? Oh, yes, Scar. I remember. Yes, I did. In your dressing room? Well, yes. Was he an old friend? No. I'd never met him before. He'd heard me sing in San Francisco. He just wanted to say hello. Carol, if people are telling the truth, and that's an open question, you were the last person to see him alive. What? He was killed the night you left Dawson. It's terrible. You didn't know about it? Well, how could I? Wasn't your marriage a little sudden? Perhaps, but what does that have to do with it? It's only a question. I'm going to ask a lot of them. No. No, I'll tell you. You'll tell me what? Why I wanted to get away from Dawson. Why our marriage was so sudden. Scar Brandon was the reason. I called myself Carol Lee and Dawson, but my real name is Donovan. I had a brother named Mike, and, well, he was... Oh, I suppose you'd call him bad. He was a gambler, perhaps even a criminal. I don't know. It didn't make any difference to me. He was my brother. The only family tie I had in the world. He was killed. No one was ever punished for it. It was an unsolved mystery. But I found out who did it. Who? Black Jack Gannon. I had no proof, and he'd already left San Francisco for the Yukon. So I came up here. I changed my name and took a job singing for him. I was looking for the chance to get even for what he'd done to Mike. But you didn't find it? No. The only way I'd hurt Gannon was through Whitey, letting him go. Well, just how does Scar Brandon enter the picture? He knew I was Mike's sister. Threatened to tell Gannon, and suddenly I was afraid. I see. That's all. That's all, Sergeant. So, does Bill have to know about... Oh, it's all so sordid. I... I haven't done anything really wrong. Can't we forget the past? You sure you've told me everything? Well, yes. Isn't it enough? No, Carol. Oh, please. Here comes Bill. Can't your questions wait until tomorrow morning? There'll be time for us to talk when he's working in the store. All right, I can wait. Yes, sir, sir. It really is going to be a blizzard. Just look at that snow come down. Huh? Yes. Your tea will be ready in a moment, Sergeant. The storm grew wilder as darkness fell that night. But even so, King found the Morgan's living quarters too hot, and he asked to be let out. The sergeant turned him into the run with the other dogs, and King burrowed down in the snow to sleep. It was after midnight when he woke up for the first time. He could hardly see the figure moving toward the forest through the falling snow, but he knew it was the girl. He barked once or twice, and then he fell asleep again. Half an hour later, he was wakened again. This time, it was by the dog. The white dog he had seen at the edge of the clearing. The dog was asking him to follow him, running a few steps toward the forest and then barking an invitation. There was a warning of danger in the white dog's barking, and instantly, King thought of the girl. Was she in some danger? If that were true, then the sergeant should be told about it. The fence of the run wasn't high, and King scrambled over it on his first attempt. He ran to the back door of the post and started scratching at it. The white dog seemed to realize he was getting help and stood motionless in the middle of the clearing. At last, the door opened. What is it, King? Sergeant, is Carol out there? No. She's gone. Carol! Sergeant, what could have happened to her? Where could she have gone? Perhaps well, King knows. Ah, there's another dog out there. Yes, the white Siberian. Get under your clothes and come with me. Right. Five minutes later, the sergeant and Bill were following King across the clearing. Whitey kept a hundred feet of head, and as the two men plunged into the forest, the sergeant told Bill about Scar's murder and the reason for his trip from Dawson. You don't think that Carol had anything to do with this, this killing, do you? I think she knows more about it than she told me this afternoon. And she's run away. No, not that, Bill. Oh, well, what then? Why would she leave the post in the middle of the night, in the middle of a storm? Where could she be going? Whitey's showing us. What's in this direction? Yeah, there's an old cabin about a mile from here, Sergeant. Nobody lives in it. There been any strangers around the post lately? No. 
Of course, I wasn't there for a couple of hours this afternoon. Oh? Strangers. I I don't get it. What would strangers have to do with Carol? Strangers to you, but not to her. I, I don't understand. Well, I've been looking for Carol ever since the night of the murder. There may have been someone who found out where she'd gone before I did. Someone who was afraid of what she could tell me, and it might be to the interest of that person to... to... keep her from talking. Yes. But she wouldn't go out into the night to meet somebody like that. We'll soon find out. The man could no longer see the white Siberian, but King kept them on his trail. And finally, they saw a faint glow ahead of them. That must be the cabin. A light in it. Yes. As they neared the edge of the clearing in which the cabin stood, Whitey began to bark. A moment later, the door swung open and Carol ran out. Carol! Carol! <laughs> Almost immediately, the figure of a man loomed up in the lighted doorway. A gun flashed in his hand. The sergeant drew, but before he could fire, Whitey had thrown himself at the man in the doorway. A shot rang out, and the dog dropped to the ground. Before the man could fire again, the sergeant's gun spoke. The man clutched his arm and slammed the door of the cabin. Carol had reached the cover of the trees and ran into Bill's arms. Oh, honey, are you all right? Yes. Poor Whitey, you tried to stop Joe from shooting. Joe, Carol? You know him. He worked for Blackjack. Who else is in that cabin? Blackjack and Red Bark. Well, why were you there? Joe stopped me at the post this afternoon. He said that I had to come out here and have a talk with Blackjack. But, Carol, why oh, didn't you I talk? Oh, I know I should have told the sergeant. I shouldn't have come, but they said they'd kill you. It's time you told me everything, Carol. I saw them kill Scar. Where and when? That night in Dawson. It was while I was out in back of the cafe, just after I let Whitey free. I looked up at the window of Blackjack's office... And I saw the shadows of two men. I saw the shadow of the knife. But you couldn't tell who was holding that knife? No. They thought I knew a lot more than I did. Now I know everything, of course, just from what they were talking about. Who killed Scar? It was Joe. Scar was trying to collect the money from Blackjack. There was a fight. Sergeant, you put out the lamp in the cabin. Take Carol with you. Take her home. But you, there's three of them. Go on, hurry. Come on, Carol. Easy, boy. Here they come. The sergeant could barely make out the figures of the three men through the thickly falling snow. He decided to try a bluff, though, and shouted, Stand where you are! You're covered! Drop your guns! Their answer was to open fire in the direction of the sergeant's voice as they scattered and ran toward the woods. The sergeant held his fire. Now it was impossible to see his opponents. And there were three against one. But the sergeant had one great advantage. King was with him. And King knew where each of the men had taken cover. Go on, boy. Find them. Easy does it. A great dog moved carefully from tree to tree, the sergeant following close on his heels. Finally, King stopped and looked up into his master's face. The sergeant could see only a few feet ahead through the darkness and the falling snow, but he listened intently. And then he heard cautious footsteps coming slowly toward him. The man stepped past the tree where the sergeant was waiting. The sergeant brought the butt of his gun down on the man's head. He dropped to the ground with a sigh. The sergeant snapped a pair of handcuffs on the man's wrist. One down and two to go, King. Go on. Once more, the stalking process began, but this time they ran into bad luck. The sergeant stumbled over a rock and hit the trunk of a tree with his shoulder. The boughs of the tree were heavy with snow, and the slight jar was enough to send the snow falling to the ground. One of the bullets nicked the tree behind which the sergeant had taken cover. He had placed the gun flashes accurately, and as soon as the volley ended, he fired and returned. There was a cry of pain, and then Blackjack's voice shouting his surrender. Don't shoot anymore. I've dropped my gun. Blackjack? Yeah. What about Joel? You've got him. He's done for. Stand right where you are. Come on, King. <laughs> Another pair of handcuffs were slapped on Blackjack's wrist. And the sergeant knelt beside Joe. The sergeant, we didn't know it was you. You thought it was Bill Morgan. That's right. And you fired at Carol as she was running away from the cabin. Well, that was Joe. And he's the one who killed Scar. He's dead, isn't he? No, he'll live to hang. Sergeant, I swear I had nothing to do with any of it. We'll see what a jury has to say about that. Go on, head for the cabin. I'll put a bandage on Joe there. Bill Morgan left his wife at the post and then hurried back through the forest to the trapper's cabin. When he opened the door, he saw Black Jack and Red Barker sitting on a bench, their hands handcuffed behind them. Joe was lying on the floor, his chest and arm bandaged with his own shirt. You captured them all, Sergeant. Yes, Bill. Good work. What are you... Oh, that's Whitey lying on your park. I thought they got him. The bullet just grazed his head. He'll live, Bill. Come here and say hello to him. Sure. Hello there, Whitey. 
He doesn't look scared at all. I think King's been telling him there's no reason to be afraid. Well, take him back to the post as soon as I finish with this bandage. By the time he's well, he'll accept it as his home. Are you telling the truth? Did that mutt bring you after Carol? He certainly did, Gannon. You made a great mistake when you turned him into an enemy. Whitey, you'll always be grateful for what you did tonight. He's a good dog, Bill. Good dog, boy. From now on, you'll be well treated. You'll find there are people you can love, and people who will love you, fellow. As for the others, well, three of them will never be able to hurt you again. Never's a long time, Sergeant. You're going to find that out, Gannon. All three of you will stand trial as soon as we get back to Dawson. And there can only be one verdict. You're through. This case is closed. <laughs> In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Friday's adventure. Picture yourself up there in the Yukon with Sergeant Preston, slugging it out with desperados with your bare fists. Think of Sergeant Preston's great strength and stamina, and the strength you would need in those fights. Then ask yourself this question. Am I eating a good bodybuilding breakfast every morning? Remember, when you include Quaker Puff wheat or Quaker Puff rice, you get added food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. And what a delicious way to get such good nourishment. There's tempting nut-like flavor and tender crispness in every mouth-watering spoonful, topped with milk or cream and fruit. Try it tomorrow. They're always a treat. Quaker Puff rice... And Quaker Puff Wheat, never sold in bags or bulk. Listen Friday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case of the Wolf Cub. When King and I found a helpless wolf cub, I turned it over to a boy named Joey Sparks. He raised it as a pet. Later, when the wolf was full grown, he went back to the wild, and Joey and I never expected to see him again. But he reappeared under thrilling and unusual circumstances. It happened in connection with a murder plot that placed both Joey and me in terrible danger. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Friday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at this same time by Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice. The breakfast cereal shot from guns. Remember, for delicious hot breakfast, enjoy Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. And here's why Quaker Oats is called the giant of the cereals. There's more growth, more endurance in oatmeal than any other whole grain cereal. So make your hot breakfast nourishing Quaker Oats. Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice. So long. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. This has been a presentation of otrwesterns.com, and we hope you enjoyed. Please take some time to like and rate our shows in your favorite podcast application. Follow us on Facebook by going to otrwesterns.com slash Facebook. Join in the conversation by going to otrwesterns.com slash Discord. And don't forget to send us an email, podcast at otrwesterns.com. 
This episode is copyright under the attribution, not commercial, share like copyright. For more information, go to otrwesterns.com slash copyright. Have a great day, and again, thanks for listening.